Hey everybody, it's Morgan here again. I've got a couple of new things uh, that we've released in the last couple of weeks uh, that I'm here to talk to you about. Although I think I'm gonna save the big stuff for uh, Andrew a little bit later on. Uh, let's go ahead and pull my screen up. All right. So uh, Pathfinder character sheet. Last time we looked at this last week, uh, I was able to show you all uh, drag and drop ancestries uh, as we're kind of continuing forward on trying to make the Pathfinder character creation experience uh, a bit more robust. Uh, we've now continued to push forward on that and uh, have just completed work on backgrounds, which will work in a really similar way. You drag those out, drop them on the header of the character sheet, and up pops a screen here where you can run through the process of choosing the ability boosts that come with the background and making other decisions that proceed from that and then applying those changes to your character. We've got a couple of other things coming up in the sheet dev spaces. A lot of them are bigger uh, bigger things that we won't be talking about until uh, next month. But uh, this month, we do wanna talk about some performance changes we're gonna be making primarily on the D&D 5e sheet. I'm sure some of you have noticed that uh, loading spells pages can take a little bit of time when you're running through the character mancer. We're doing some specific work to improve character mancer performance pretty much on any screen that shows a big, huge list, but most particularly that uh, wizard level up page with all of those spells that can take a really long time to load. Uh, we've got some things that we've been working on specifically facing content creators. I thought it would be good to let everybody know about that since this stuff really lets content creators get more things out there. So one of the things that plagues folks who put map content up on our marketplace is how big, how hard it can be to get big map packs set up with the uh, appropriate uh, pre-built grid dimensions, something they pretty much have to go in through manually. So we've created a bit of an automated process here uh, that we're hoping will speed that up and help more map makers to give you stuff on Roll20 and to help them do it faster. So here's just a quick look at what that looks like. On the right is the new process where they're just gonna set in the grid cell width and that's pretty much it. Uh, this is worth talking about too. Uh, we've made this upload process asynchronous. Basically what that means is we made it a lot faster. Uh, and so this would have taken a long time for content creators before. Now it's just a handful of seconds. And in just a second, one on the right is now done. It's been pre-populated. Everything is already set up to go. As long as the default grid size is the same on all of those map components, uh, that should be uh, all ready to go and set up. And meanwhile, this other side is gonna be going on for about another five to 10 minutes setting this up. Now, of course, like this isn't as fancy or special for players uh, other than just getting more content to you that quickly, but this is kind of a pre-look at some of the work that we're doing just generally to try to make map setup more quick and easy. So expect to see more in that area in the, in the upcoming months. This is another little tool we put together for content creators. This is uh, something that not a lot of folks see on the regular, but it used to be an extremely cumbersome process for publishers uh, who owned their own uh, compendiums to push expansions by themselves. They needed a lot of touch points with Roll20 staff and we had to help them a lot through the process and it could really slow them down. Uh, basically all you're seeing on this screen is that as a compendium owner on Roll20, I can now create the compendium ex expansion by myself. And this is part of an ongoing effort here. We're trying to make compendium creation more accessible. We're trying to get to a point where uh, soon compendium owners will be able to create the compendiums themselves, not just expansions. And you know, although I don't wanna make too many promises because this is a long and winding road, this is step one on the very long path towards putting compendium creation into the hands of not just content creators, but uh, of players as well. All right, last thing I'm pretty excited to show you all. Uh, some folks may recognize this screen. Uh, don't uh, pay attention to the uh, the green roll 20 up here. It's just uh, our internal test environment and how I know I'm not on live. Uh, this is the character vault. Uh, a lot of people take advantage of this feature to store backup copies of old characters or to move NPCs in and out of games. But uh, they're, those folks who are familiar might notice there's a new button here. Uh, and a new one up here. So let's take a look at what that is. 
So here is my character vault character all loaded up. My profile's up here. I can open the compendium. All of this outside of VTT. Take a look at compendium items. If I want to consider switching from my great axe to a long sword, I can pop that open here and look at the details. And what's more, without even going to the VTT, if I want to take a swing at somebody, I can do that. And there's that die result. And there's my damage. So this is, of course, only impactful for vault characters, which are characters that have been specifically exported outside of games. So just to be totally transparent here, these are not your characters that are in your games accessible outside of the VTT yet. Uh, this is step one on the way, again, to uh, something that we're really excited about and we'll definitely talk about more next month. Not quite ready to divulge all of the details, but uh, again, this is uh, just the beginning of a direction that we're headed in. And so, of course, for creating a character here, this is going to be the same as it would be on the VTT, uh, except that you're not in a game, so you need to pick the sheet. So let's say we're going to make Vlarg Vlargington. That'll be a D&D 5e character. And there we go. I can use the character mancer and start stepping through that whole process. I can upload my avatar image. I can open and edit my bio and info. And again, we'll have that roll log here so that as you've gone through and made roles during the, your character creation process or while playing uh, a game uh, you know, in person or wherever you might be, uh, those role logs will generate here. So again, that's step one, and uh, we're going to be really excited to tell you more about that in the next couple of months. All right, that's it for today. Thanks, everybody, for your time. Next up is Adam and Eve that are going to show you some of our content releases. I am Eve Crockett. I am a producer with Roll20. Um, my, my official title is Production Goblin. Um, and I, I handle the um, VTT conversions here. And I'm Adam Jury. I uh, Roll20. I am in Partner Services, which means I talk back and forth with our publishers, our other creators, make sure they can get stuff up on the site, handle troubleshooting, and uh, I keep a, a close eye on the drive through RPG front page to see what's new and interesting. We have a huge month of releases um, on both sides uh, here that, I, that we'd like to talk about. Um, I think I'll start. Um, Take it away, Eve. Starting off, um, I'd like to talk about the Pathfinder and uh, Starfinder Infinite titles that we just released. Um, Danger Dossier being the first of those, uh, as well as Boosted Bestiary. Both of those are going to add additional monsters to either your Starfinder game in the case of Danger Dossier, or your uh, Pathfinder 2 game in the case of Boosted Bestiary. Uh, Danger Dossier especially is super cool because it takes all of the various, um, predominantly what you'd think of as fantasy monsters, and it presents stat blocks for them uh, for Starfinder. Um, you have things like Lantern Archons and um, Prism Dragons in there that are just, it's so cool to have them in a, a sci-fi game. Boosted Bestiary, on the other hand, takes the approach of uh, 
getting multiple different level variants of uh, a lot of otherwise common monsters so that you can always find that monster you need that is appropriate to the level of your party, um, hopefully preventing, you know, or causing that TPK. Um, we also have two adventures that just came out for Pathfinder Infinite as well. Uh, these are Tales from the Dark Archive, The Isle in the Mist, and Impossible Experiments, The Guardian of Gitna. Both are super cool, very short adventures that have been presented as uh, add-ons on Roll20 so that you can just slot them into your existing game and you're good to go. Perfect for uh, when you need a filler for, for that plot that you've been running uh, because we've taken care of everything so that you don't really have to do much prep at all. Um, it's all presented right there in the VTT in the form of journal handouts and uh, all of the monsters already laid out on, uh, on the maps. Next, I want to talk about um, our continued DMs Guild conversions. These are just the, the the set that we have just launched are possibly my favorite name wise titles that I I've ever seen uh, with the exception of uh, the the Honkonomicon that I think that Adam wants to talk about um, we have two adventures from DMs Guild creators, I find that familiar, uh, and Volo's Guide to Getting Murdered, which is just the perfect name. Uh, I I love it so much. Um, and, and then we... Can't believe nobody used that name up until now. Like, <laughs> Guide to Getting Murdered with, a you know, any variable in front of it. Like, yeah. Look until 2023. Yeah, no, it's it's perfect. Uh <laughs> it is it is phenomenal. Uh, we also just released Xanathar's Lost Notes to Everything Else, uh, which is a compendium expansion, um, uh, adding subclasses and um new player archetypes for um D&D 5th edition. Uh, on the 24th, we have a Pathfinder adventure and a Starfinder uh, compendium expansion coming up. Uh, the Pathfinder adventure is called the Enmity Cycle. And what I have seen of it is exceptional. Uh, for Starfinder, though, we have Ports of Call, which is going to take your Starfinder game all over their universe. It adds so much, to, uh, just detail to all of these different uh, locations around Absalom that... They've mentioned in various books and adventures and just hadn't fully expanded on. In Ports of Call, all of that information is, pre is presented directly in our compendium with the ability to uh, drag a piece of information right out there in the form of a handout that you can provide to your players. And it's going to cover all of the information that, that you would need to add some super cool uh, locations to, to your game. Um, and then coming up at the end of the month, we have, with PaizoCon, 
a total of four uh, Pathfinder and Starfinder Society titles. This is the first time that we have released a uh, Pathfinder Society or Starfinder Society adventure on Roll20. And so much attention has gone into making these the best possible way that you could play them. Uh, those are Within the Prairies and Shattering Golden Chains uh, for Pathfinder. And for Starfinder, we have Drift Scars and Intro Year of Fortune's Fall. Uh, these are, again, society titles, which means that they have everything that you need to uh, be able to play them as part of the ongoing um, Pathfinder or Starfinder Society um, storylines. Hey, Eve. I'm correct in that the Pathfinder and Starfinder infinite titles that are going to the VTT and the DMs Guild ones, those are also, they're all available on DMs Guild and Drive Through RPG. So people, yes. if they want to, if they, if they like, like reading the PDF, but play on the VTT, they can all be, all be doing that. Yes. Yes. That is 100% correct. Uh, both the Pathfinder infinite and DMs Guild titles any of those that we release on the VTT, they're also available on Drive Through RPG. You can get the PDF um, and you can read through the PDF. And then when you're ready, you can transition that straight over to the VTT and um, get your players in. Sweet. I don't know how many people like curl up in bed to read the VTT. It seems like might want to put the PDF on your iPad for curling up in bed or, you know, reading under the tree in the park. Might just be me. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, it's probably not just you. Much much longer, it'll be me too. Let's be real. Yeah, yeah. I, I hope it's not just me. <laughs> uh... All right, let's check out Twilight Imperium, Embers of the Imperium from Edge Studios, formerly part of Fantasy Flight Games. And uh, as many people know, the board game, it, it, you know, it has a long playing time. But when you've got I've always, RPG, you, you can stretch that playing time out even more. And uh, this is a great looking book. It uses the Genesis system. So there's not a lot of rules in this book. Uh, it focuses a lot on the source material. And, and the, the, the game mechanics, their source material intermingled with that. One of the things I really like when you get to the species section, we have a section here under like the Hylar for like, why play a Hylar? And it tells you game mechanic and universe reasons why you might want to be that species. And personally, like when I'm diving into a new setting, I really like the, the things that help give context and normalize different parts of the setting. Um, and again, it's that's so cool i i love that I, i've always wanted to play twilight imperium but that play length has has always driven me off yeah and it's definitely like a setting with like some unique names jargon and so anything that can help introduce people to it and just close that difficulty gap i think is great um, and again, so much of the book is just source material. So we've got part of a faction guide here and it's gorgeous. And then, you know, there's a, there's a big gear chapter, a vehicles chapter, of course, you know, all the sort of stuff. And then this uh, lovely universe map, galaxy map. Um, it, super, super cool. Um, that is gorgeous. Yeah. I mean, Edge always goes all out in the visuals of their games and this is, it's a treat. Um, and speaking of going all out, um, created by Dice Tail Games, published by Modiphius, we have Blood of Doom, the primer for it. But, you know, some games have a primer that's like a 32 page quick start. This one's over 500 pages and features 300 pages of the core book. 
a uh, 150 page pre preview of the setting book and then 108 pages of their cults book, which are their three core books. And this was funded on Kickstarter April for the full version, but you can get this 500 pages for free on drive-thru right now. Um, How big and, is and the full version? I, you know, I, don't, I think the full version is over 900 pages. So that's big, but 500 pages for free is pretty wild. And this is also, this is a great looking book. Um, I really like they call out the base mechanics in very simple, simple boxes so you can skim it quickly. And as a lot of games are kind of moving to this, it's, it's player facing. So mostly players are doing the die rolls in this game, which helps obviously keep the mechanical load off the GM um, and reduces some of those bad feels when the GM's rolling rolling really well and none of the players can roll well that day uh, it's gorgeous gorgeous art there's this weird skeleton thing down here that that's not human um and then when we go into the classes i really like they have these core classes like the assassin but the assassin has archetypes within it so there's the ninja and the Viper, and this is the Viper. It's got you know starting equipment, armor proficiencies, everything like that. So there's dozens of these. Um, and here I pulled out one of the weapons pages. It looks like it might be appropriate for the Viper. We've got you know some short swords of various types, claymore, and all that. Okay, maybe some of those are a bit heavy for the for the Viper, but you know you get the picture. And then we'll, like moving in, obviously we've got a big monster section with a lot of uh, setting and lore material about the monsters. And like, look at that mummy art. That's just that that's gorgeous uh, mummy art. I yeah, can't I... get over the viper though. All those windows better watch out. Yeah, yeah. Oh, super good. I'm also a little concerned that this mummy might be getting too close to that torch. Um, but that, I mean, that's his business. So those are a couple of the, the titles on drive through itself that have been doing real, really well lately. But we also added a new community content program, and that's Hollow Streets, uh, which is the Shadowrunner Collective. And Hollow Streets is a very wide open community program. You can make Shadowrun material for any edition, first through six. Um, and Catalyst has been very generous with that. So I'm gonna highlight a couple of the titles that have already appeared. Uh, the first one is Allies and Enemies, and it's a book of non-player characters uh, for the Sixth World edition. It's 150 pages and it has a bunch of formula for uh, calculating how to stat out characters very in depth. And then we have Popular Cybernetics, which compiles a bunch of older cybernetics from previous editions and updates them to the new mechanics. So people who have played in the past might want that. Exotics has um, rules for exotic species that have not, not been covered in previous editions. So there's drakes, monads, and shapeshifters. Um, and this uh, exotics has been done by uh, uh, J. Keith Henry, who is a, a established Shadowrun author. And I believe that Allies and Enemies is also done by an established Shadowrun author. So there's some stuff that these people have obviously been thinking about for a long time. And for one run run reason or another, couldn't get it into Catalyst production schedule, but they banged them out already. And then this is Fast Jack's Shadow Files, and I was delighted when I saw this because we all, anyone who's been in a Shadow Run remembers all of the different Shadow Talker casts leaving comments within the source books and being sassy with each other and dropping little tidbits of lore. And Fast Jack's Shadow Files, first off, it has a timeline of all of the books published in English and German and what time they appear in the game timeline and then it lists all of the authors that have written sections of an in-character shadow on source book and which ones and then it does it for all of the commenters as well so a couple pages of this i just want to highlight like some of these people you know they just show up once in a while um but some of them like 2xl has appeared in dozens of books hundreds of times 
Uh, so if you're a real nerd about the Shadowrun setting, this is a, a wild reference guide. And uh, I can't imagine the amount of time that it has taken to compile this. Um, and I'm sure that it'll get updated as new stuff comes out. So I think that's a really cool deep dive into Shadowrun. I'll have to take a look at that. Shadowrun is directly responsible for me working here. So, yeah, um, it's definitely, you know, it definitely comes up uh, as the favorite game or a formative game for several Roll20 employees. Uh, so, uh, which edition of Shadowrun do you prefer has uh, been, been my icebreaker with a few employees? Third here. And then we'll move on to uh, DM's Guild, which of course is fifth edition D&D &D stuff, um, creator content. Um, I have two titles to show here. First is Solo Adventures Toolbox by Paul Bimler. And this is exactly what it says on the tin. It is a set of rules and guidelines for running yourself through solo D&D &D adventures using a question answer mechanic where you're going to be asking yes no questions and then you're going to be doing random roll tables to kind of determine what happens and build on from there and it has uh it has guidelines for like wilderness locations and encounters and urban and dungeons so it covers the gamut there and this one um is a dm's guild title that is not just available in pdf but is also available in print um, and it's, uh, it's, it's light if you're going to print it out. If you've got a lot of reference tables, it has some examples to go through as well. So that's pretty neat for uh, people who don't have a campaign going or um, just want to, you know, maybe generate some ideas, use it as a brainstorming tool. That one also just came out on the VTT. Uh, sure did. We just released that. Uh, so that... I mean, that's an ideal one if you want to take the VTT to bed or to the park with you. And then uh, last, certainly not least on this uh, recap, we are going to talk about a Roll20 staff favorite, the Honkonomicon. Finally. Uh, it was catapulted to the, the top of the bestseller charts and we were all kind of like, really? But uh, I think this one proves that, like, gamers love humor. And sometimes I always think that game books don't reflect the humor that happens at the table. They take a very serious approach to it, and then people have to add their own humor. And Honkonomicon, I mean, Honkonomicon is play, playing it straight, but obviously has a lot of humor. We're going to take a quick look at the table of contents. We've got goose subclasses, goosish magic, magic honktums, and uh, the goosterium in this book. And it's 80 pages. It's not like a six-page hee-hee joke. You know, this is this is serious. I'm going to look, uh, we're going to look at the bard, the college of feathers. So there's a full, a full write-up here of a bunch of different, um, a bunch of different classes and uh here we have the feather bard performing and some magic items such as the honk arena which i think is especially appropriate this month as uh many people have been diving into a certain switch game and also the honk and bonker which just rolls off the tongue into monsters, we have a feathered ooze, which is an ooze that can disguise itself as a bunch of feathers and droppings. So a goose. It, it's kind of like a goose. It's most it's most of the important parts of a goose. All right, we're gonna go from this disgusting feathered ooze um, down into Sir Goose in all of his glory and and i mean if that doesn't make you want to play a goose and nothing will nothing will i love him i he's he's perfect he is he is like i actually i kind of want an art print of that and also um i think everyone's probably familiar with you know the dogs playing poker painting from years ago 
and there have been, you know, dogs playing D and D spinoffs of it. And now I kind of want geese playing D and D. Just yeah, a little, little beak poking out from behind the DM screen. I think that'd be good. All all this has proved to me is less that gamers love humor and more that gamers just love geese. Yeah. And weirdly, well, they're better inside than outside in gaming terms. I saw some geese earlier today and I was not impressed. Neither was my dog. All right, so that's going to wrap up title stuff on Drive Through DMs Guild, and Hollow Streets. We want to talk about a couple items that are coming up on our site soon at Community Wise. Two things. First up is D Design Dash. And Design Dash is going to return this summer, and it's going to be expanded to be based in our community content programs. And this friendly competition show, it brings Iron Chef to tabletop role-playing games. Three designers will be going head-to-head -to, -head to create an encounter from a surprise prompt in just 50 minutes. And uh, Design Dash will be hosted by Brooke Whitney and Danny Quach. And... Uh, going to be coming back after a hiatus, so we're all really excited for that and hopefully going to see some people sliding in and doing some of their first tabletop design in it. And then our annual Game Jam Pocket Quest has returned for its second year, which now means it's annual. Um, and this year's theme is Not of This World, which is all about games focused on space. And it's a two month challenge. So it started a couple of weeks ago for designers to create a standalone game of 20 pages or less. And it ends on July 1st, which is Canada Day. And uh, did you know that the robotic arm on the Canadian Space Station was designed in Canada? I didn't. Yeah, what? it's called the Canada Arm, um, which is, is a weird mouthful. It doesn't, that does not flow off the tongue. No. Um, but it does prove that Canadians love to lend a hand. And last year... Oh. That's right. That's right. Last year, Pocket Quest, uh, was, there was over 100 titles for our summer camp-themed Pocket Quest, and we brought a bunch of new creators and publishers onto the site, so that was exciting. We're going to hope to have at least that many this year. Um... And we have a Discord, a section on our Discord strictly for it. So if you go to discord.gg slash rollthrough, R-O-L-L-T-H-R-U, discord.gg rollthrough, uh, you can join, meet the Pocket Quest community. And uh, there's people like sharing advice with each other and like, you know, will you look at my mechanics? I'll look at your mechanics, doing playtesting stuff. So um that's uh, excited to see how far into orbit this year's Pocket Quest can go. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad that there's still plenty of time for that because I just started work on mine the other day. Nice, yeah. I mean, we, we extended the period this year, made it a little longer. We have some great templates on the site that were designed by our very own Sandra. So people who are, uh, depending on what software they have, they can make they can make their contribution in Word or Affinity Publisher or InDesign if they have that. Or, you know, I know some people who are working in Canva to do it, um, which is wow. Super. Yeah, that's it's, awesome. Yeah, uh, somebody actually this is a tangent, but somebody put a print book created in Canva on Drive Through recently, and that that blew my mind um, in a good way. But Eve, uh, do you have anything else to talk about on the sites? I don't. That is everything from me. Uh, I look forward to Pocket Quest and Design Dash, especially uh, coming back. That that sounds like the perfect way for people to get started on either DMs Guild or uh, the Pathfinder Infinite or Starfinder Infinite programs, uh, since it is focused on uh, the community content creation. Yeah, for sure. A lot of ways for creators to get into publishing and making things, um, whether it be for their favorite games or their own games. So a lot of new opportunities on DriveThru. We're going we're gonna to keep focusing on those and keep making it easier for people to intermingle their stuff between drive-through and roll 20 VTT. Uh, 
So it's my favorite thing about the, this community and this hobby is the the sheer creativity of people and all of the ways that uh, that they can show that off and drive through just makes it so easy. Yeah, I couldn't take my eyes off our Discord channel once the Pocket Quest channel launched. I'm like, whoa, these people are talking a lot. I'm getting real distracted. Let's close Discord and get some work done. All right, but I think that's going to wrap it up. So uh, we can't wait to hear about your next adventure and see you next time on Reroll. Thanks for joining us. Hey. Thank you so much for everything that you have uh, seen so far, staying around. Um, there is so much stuff coming out on Roll20 and Drive Through RPG that we can't even fit it into an entire segment. In fact, I've got a few more things that are coming out that you should know about for sure. For example, uh, coming out in the next couple of days from Wizards of the Coast, you'll be able to pre-order the Big B Presents Glory of the Giants. That opens tomorrow on the Roll20 Marketplace. So set your calendar, uh, just a timer maybe. Ask Alexa to set you a timer and uh, go in and pre-order that right away. Next, two more things. Next is uh, Candela Obscura, quick start guide coming from Roll20, uh, excuse me, from uh, Critical Role. And this is gonna come on to Drive Through RPG. So let me state that again. <laughs> Candela Obscura, quick start guide from Critical Role will come on to Drive Through RPG on the 25th so that's not tomorrow but the next day go get that you can then start playing those and start seeing what those things look like it's going to be amazing but lastly and i'm really excited about this one is a girl by moonlight quick start guide from the evil hat productions and this is going to go on both roll 20 and drive through so you can get it in both places um, you can go ahead and get that quick start guide and start playing um, and uh, they are going to start launching their quick start campaign, their backer kit, excuse me, their backer kit campaign tomorrow. So you can get those tomorrow and uh, uh, let them know what you think. Um, thank you again. Uh, there's a few more things um, that we are gonna talk about today. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about performance improvements on the VTT specifically. And then we're gonna go through a new design for the VTT. I'm gonna show you what we have and what we'll be releasing very shortly. Um, and then you will be able to ask me questions. So if you have questions, throw them up specifically about the VTT redesign and what's going to happen and how is it going to work, throw them into the chat, and then I'll try to get to them as, as quickly as I can. Um, all right, so first, performance improvements. Um, this is something that we are thinking about and actively trying to improve. Um, it is... Uh, there are many, many layers to performance, but it is something that we are, are continuing to try to improve. In fact, we've already done a lot to try to do that. Each time we find something that is, uh, each time you tell us, this is super laggy, this is something that is not, um, not, not uh, performing well, we dig in and we're gonna continue to do that. So for example, we've released a lot of updates recently around the, uh, the loading of compendiums and we're gonna continue to work on that area. We're also looking at uh, the way that we render the back end of the, the, the canvas or the, the map area and how we can do that in a better way. In fact, we just released um, a very meaningful update there for a lot of people, especially those that have very low frame rates. Um, so this is something that's gonna continue to happen as we go along and there are um, lots and lots more that we can do and lots of that, that we already have. So um, keep an eye out for those things. Now, for the redesign, as I get into this, I want to mention, um, I want to answer the question right off the bat, why are we redesigning the VTT? And yes, if you're hearing it for the first time, we are redesigning the VTT. Why are we doing that? A lot of people say it's because uh, you, we, we just need a modern look. And that's not, that's not untrue. That's definitely true. We, we, we do want to improve the way it looks. But the main reason that we're doing it is because we want to improve how easy it is to accomplish what you're trying to do. And the reason we're trying to do that is because we understand that the easier it is in Roll20 for you to be able to tell your story, the easier it is for you to create meaningful memories with your friends. When you go and revisit those memories years in, in, in the future from now, we don't want you to think about, oh, that UI was, it was hard to accomplish that thing. It, I, I couldn't even figure it out. 
We want you to remember your story with your friends. And so that's really what we're going to try to do. Every time we release something new, every time we push something, we're going to think in the back of our heads, does this help you tell a better story with your friends? Does this help you create better memories? Um, and that's that's what we're going to try to do. Um, that's that's what's behind all of this. Now, before I go into it, too, th there's one thing that you will also know. In uh, When we do release this shortly, um, you will have an opt-in. We're not going to just push this on people. Um, and the reason that we're doing this opt-in the way we are is because we really want your feedback. We also recognize that um, we can't go and redesign something as big as our VTT by just sort of shutting ourselves in a room, coding for a really long time, and then coming out and saying, here it is, it's done. <laughs> no, we need your feedback. We need to hear your thoughts and opinions about how it works for you so that we can um, change it and modify it. It's it's not a monologue. It's not for us to just say, like, here is the thing and push it on you. It's a dialogue. It's here's some things. What do you think? And then you respond back and you give us feedback. And then we say, oh, okay, I see what you're saying. And what do you think now? And we're going to do that as we go through this whole project. In fact, the first thing that we're going to release when we do is not the entirety of the, the, uh, the whole VTT. We're going to release it in pieces. We're going to release the first part as the toolbar. And the reason we chose the toolbar, um, there's a long article around um, a lot of the research that we did and a lot of thinking that went into this around last year. But um, at the heart of it, we believe that the, the toolbar is some of the biggest changes that we can make right away. It is the first point at which people get into the VTT and its functionality. And it's a small and modular area that we can start with. Um, You'll notice that a lot of it is not necessarily changed. We're, we're doing it small pieces, okay? Um, and the reason we're doing that is so we can get your feedback. We do a little bit, get your feedback. All right. So before I get in, know that there is an opt-in. This is not going to be pushed on everybody. You can opt out at any time. Um, and we very much appreciate your feedback. So um, with that said, I'm going to go ahead and start the demo where you will be already opted in. All right, so in here, you can already immediately see, first, no spoilers, this is the death house. So if you are currently playing the death house, um, just uh, section off your brain, I guess. <laughs> um, first off, you will notice the left side here, the, the sidebar is completely new. Um, and uh, it is currently attached to the side instead of like this floating element here. We've also made the icons a little bit bigger so that they're a little bit more accessible so you can hit those notes really easily. Um, we've also changed some of the icons around a little bit. Um, the idea here is uh, we, are, we are reorganizing how some of those tools work and we need to make sure that our icons are um, appropriate for that. Now, this is uh, pop quiz. <laughs> pop quiz. Okay. Everybody that's currently in the chat, I want you to look at the very top icon here at the very top. And I want you sequentially to go down in a, in a chat message and tell me what you think each one of those things are. Yes. We're just going to do this in chat and you're going to post it in chat and it's going to get real chaotic. I'm sorry, moderators. I didn't let you know. <laughs> um, put it, put it straight into chat. Um, and uh, the reason we're going to put it in chat is so that we can keep you accountable. As I go through, you'll be able to see and see other people and see what they thought. And, and we'll be able to judge you heavily if you got it wrong. No, 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 I'm just kidding. No, we're going to um, uh, we're going to use that to try to make sure that we're hitting the right notes. So as I'm talking here, continue to, to do this sort of pop quiz and feel free to, to publish that into the, the Twitch chat when you are ready. Um, we are looking to try to make sure that these icons align with your general idea of what is underneath that tool. So this sort of, before I start telling you what those are, I would love to know what your first, first thought is. Um, as you're doing that, I'm going to actually direct your attention down to the very bottom down here. Now, this area is the layers. And it is, uh, as you will notice, for longtime users, it has been pulled out of that, that menu. So no longer do you have to like hover over that, make sure that you're very, and you come over to it and then click to the one to get to that one. And then are you on it or not? Who knows, right? Now we've pulled it out, we put it at the bottom and we indicate which layer you're actually on. So as you can see, 
the layer switches and it stays active. So that way you know, like, oh, am I on the token layer? Oh, here, I'm not, now I am. This will give you uh, a better idea of um, how the map is structured as we go forward. Um, let us know how this works for you and if this is a huge improvement or not. Um, that's that's one of our main th main pushes for this. We want to try to make sure that our um, our layers are easily identifiable. Um, in fact, when we were doing our research around this, the the design team found it very hard to do a lot of user testing because people could not figure out what you, what layer they were on. Um, and so we realized that while we were trying to test other things, this is probably one of our first problems that we need to solve is people need to know what layer they're on. Um, so back to the top, I'm uh, imagining, I'm not following along, but I'm imagining you've already posted it. If you haven't, then you're cheating and you should post it really quickly. <laughs> um, okay, I'm gonna go from the top down. And I'm gonna show you what each one of these are. For the majority of these, they're not fully uh, new. They're just existing functionality. In fact, what we're trying to do is keep current functionality and improve where we can, but baseline, keep current functionality and change a few things. Um, so it, we'll, we'll talk about them. Actually, this first one is a good example of something that is very different. It's not existing. Um, this first one, we're calling it settings. Now, your first thought might be, don't you, Andrew, don't you already have a lot of settings? Yes, <laughs> we, do, we do. But we think that this area is going to be very helpful for us to start elevating certain things that are not elevatable. I'm not sure if that's a word. You can decide for yourself um, on the UI as it stands. So when I click on this, you'll see a couple of new options, um, things that are previously undiscoverable or hard to discover. Um, for example, preview as player, copy link, and opt out of the UI. This is this would be important. And exit the game. This is a this is a uh, and usually a hidden thing, um, but now it's front and center. So let's go over this first one. This one's actually my favorite. I really like it. So if I were to click this, it does the exact same thing today as Control L. In fact, you can even see that we're we're starting to show you what those those new keystrokes are. Now, um, if I were to click that, I would immediately get previewing as all tokens that have sight. So this token and this token. And as you can see at the bottom, there is two tokens that I'm previewing as. So we're gonna start listing them out for you, or I, I should say collecting them at the bottom so you can actually see. If I were to actually have just one of these selected, so this token right here, I would actually, uh, and I could, I came over here to push preview as player, you would see previewing as Andrea. Oh, cool. So now I know exactly who I'm previewing as. I don't even have to have keep that token selected. I can preview as that token and, and walk around and and see how that works. Perfect. Next, copy game link. This works just like you would expect. It copies it um, to your, your clipboard so you can easily get that to somebody else if you need to. So you know, a person's running late and they're like, what is the game link? Oh, you've got it right there. Perfect. You don't have to scroll back up and chat <laughs> and try to find it. You don't have to like right click it and copy it. Those, those, those sorts of things. Um, you can get the, uh, okay, moving on. Dark mode, opt in and out. So this is where you'll, where you'll opt out of it. And then exit the game. This will allow you to exit the game, close it down, and um, uh, tell your players here, get out of the game. <laughs> All right, next. This is um, your select tool. It is um, like every other select tool that, uh, that we've had before. The one thing I wanna mention here is, and you'll, you've seen this a couple of times now, we're gonna specifically start trying to connect keyboard shortcuts, which we've been very dependent on in the past, to their actual action on the UI. This represents a real change in our thinking and our principles. We wanna make sure that no essential functionality is only accessible through a keyboard shortcut. So as we start to go through this, we're gonna start telling ourselves, is that keyboard shortcut essential? Do people, like, is that something people absolutely need? Can we find a way we can put that somewhere so that people don't have to just magically know what that shortcut is or go and look it up. So you'll see as we start to redesign, we're gonna start trying to lift these up. We're gonna to try to teach people what these are, right? So that that way they initially find them on the UI. Oh, that's cool. I didn't know we could do that. And then, oh, I, I can do that even faster if I just click, uh, hit control S. Next one here is panning. So this one's new. Um, well, we, we had it before, but um, this one is explicitly out on the toolbar. This is primarily for a lot of new users who had a lot of lot hard time trying to figure out, what, how do I pan on this thing? Again, 
right clicking or dra and dragging is uh, something that's more discoverable. They might not Im immediately know that. So you can do that now uh, with the right click and drag, just like normal. Uh, but there's a there's a tool that specifically tells you. All right, next, draw. This is uh, unchanged. Um, this has uh, all the same sort of functions here as it did before. Text tool. So I, I think a lot of you got this in your pop quiz, I hope at least. <laughs> um, text tool is unchanged as well. Um, you can see that uh, there is um, all these options. A couple of things that we did add, um, minor, was uh, we added bold and we added italic as well. So a couple more options. We just felt like, oh, that's, that's uh, you might need those. Um, we're also looking at here adding in the actual font for each one of these so you can tell which one of those are. Those are just small improvements. All right, next is the effects tool. This works just the same. So if I wanted to beam someone in the face with acid, I would do it just the same way as I did it before. Plow. Next is the place light tool. This happens just the same as before. So um, for all of those that got this one right, congratulations. That one is just placing some lights. Next is the uh, fog of war. This one has the same icon as it did before. So hopefully you all understood what this one might have been. Um, and uh, it's the same sort of layout. We're, we're going to look at this one in the future. So uh, stay tuned there. And then next is the measure tool. So this one is the same as it was before. Um, and as you can see, it has that measure. And you can measure things. But I will say, um, this is one where when we first released this, same functionality as before. But we're going to start looking at, um, almost immediately after we release this, new ways to measure. Um, those ways would involve uh, measuring in a shape. <laughs> um, so for example, if you had a um, a spell that only affected a certain radius around you, you'll be able to measure in a circle so that that way you can know like how, what's my affected area. Or if you had say a large fireball that you want to hurtle across the, <laughs> the battlefield, you'll be able to know what's the area of effect. Um, these tools will start um, adding fairly quickly um, and uh, you'll be able to see those after this first initial update. Um, so Again, to clarify and make sure I'm setting right expectations. Um, first, same tools as before. After that, we're going to start looking at new ways to measure. Next one, this is the turn order. The turn order currently is unmodified, and you can see here it is. Um, it is just the same turn order that we had from before. And then lastly, this is the dice. Now, the dice functionality is very similar. It is uh, all the same sort of buttons, but the problem, the, the 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 difference here is before you would hover over this and then hover over the option you wanted and then click it and then it would all go away. We've actually decided we're going to start using this new pattern that we have and we're going to start pulling it out just like we have for the torn order where it actually stays active on your screen. We're going to do the same thing for the dice roller. That way, it's available to you if you need it really quickly. You can just throw it in one or two or whatever you need. Um, if you don't want it, you can click it off. All right. So that is the toolbar. <laughs> uh, I, I, I'm not sure exactly how you did, but we'll review it afterward and we'll give you your grade on your pop quiz. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, the, uh, the last things I wanna mention are, um, we did revamp the, the, the zoom slightly. So you can zoom in and out, of course, just like normal, but you can also hit a uh, zoom to fit. So as you notice here, I'm only showing the first two floors of the death house here. Um, but I actually want to see the whole thing. So I hit zoom to fit, and now I can see the whole thing. Again, spoilers, don't look up here. Don't look. <laughs> um, now I can see the whole thing all on my screen all at once. This is going to be really, really good for those people that are like, I only see a black screen. Oh, did you hit, did you go to zoom fit? Okay, now I see where everything's at. Um, so that, that'll that help. There We have a couple other plans in the future of how we might um, solve some of those things. But this is our first thought. The other thing is, with this zoom, you can actually hit the right click on this and get to a slider. So you can actually slide in really easily here. Um, it's just a, a nice little thing. It's not required. You can do it just as easily without the slider, but um, there is that as well. All right, last thing. I wanna show you what this looks like as a player. So I'm gonna reload. Um, don't look at that, that opt-in. It's not what it's gonna look like. So here is that opt-in. As you can see, I've got a black screen. I've gotta go search for what I'm looking for. Here it is. 
So now I am opted, I'm in a, as a player and I can see what the player um, is looking for. I have all the same options except for some that don't make sense for me as a player. So I've got dark mode, I can opt in and out of the beta, uh, of the, the redesign, and I can still exit the game here. Um, and I've got all the same sort of tools that I had from before. Of course, I don't have layers because players don't have layers. But let's talk about this option really quickly. So opting in and out from a player's perspective. So yes, the answer to that question is players will be able to opt in and out on their own. It's not going to be saved for the game. So you as the GM will opt the entire game in. You'll just opt yourself. Um, this allows you to like test it out without affecting your players. Um, it also allows them to sort of try it out if they want to or mix out of it because it doesn't make sense to them. Um, anyway, uh, that is pretty much the entire demo. So um, we're going to go back to GM screen and then we're going to start taking some questions. Um, first, I just want to say, before we start taking questions, I really, really appreciate it. Thank you very much for your feedback. Um, it is uh, valuable for us. In fact, um, so much so that um, if we... We have internal metrics that if we don't get the level of adoption with this uh, toolbar, that we we have a, an internal metric that we've set for ourselves. If we don't get to that level of adoption, then we won't be pushing this toolbar out. We'll continue to iterate on it until we hit a certain level of adoption. This is us trying to make sure and keep ourselves accountable to uh, releasing something that is usable for people that is actually solving your problems. So. All right, let's go to the first question that I have. Um, this is from Red Archon One. Question: Will the opt-in redesign be initially compatible with current API modes? So the answer to this question is yes, in some respects. <laughs> so the only real thing we're changing here is the way the UI looks. So if your API introduces new styling or anything like that, then it could be affected. Yes. But we're not going to we're not going to change the underlying part of the API to either allow for more functionality or remove functionality from you, right? So right now we're only particularly worried about how does the UI on the toolbar look. Um, so um, I, I hope for those out there that do have additions or changes to how the UI operates, um, let me know. Get with me quickly, and uh, we can we can work through it. Um, and uh, that way APIs are. Uh, can update as they go. So um, next one, Rain Midnight. Is the opt-in per player or per game? So we've answered that one. Um, it is per person, so each user. And in fact, when you opt in, it will be all of your games um, on that browser. Um, if you go to a different browser, you'll have to opt in again. If you go to a different uh, device entirely, you'll have to opt in again as well. All right. Um, next one, um, MGS Revolver, one, okay. Um, are the hotkeys for any UI elements changing? Um, the answer to that is no, not wholly. Some of them were reconsidering a little bit, um, but I'm trying to think back in my head. Um, I don't know of any specifically that are changing, um, but I will tell you, that we are going to make sure that we're going to update the help center article with all of these changes. There are there are a few of them that are uh, uh, either undocumented or they are slightly different. But the heart of your question is: Are you changing anything specifically? And no, we're not. We're not. the The goal of this is not to change all of your key, um, your hotkey uh, um, shortcuts. The goal here is to make sure that we can um, put them in the UI. All right. Next question again from Red Archon. It's getting getting a lot of uh, a lot of questions here. That's great. Um, will I be able to run a game using this without my players needing to opt in too? So yes, answer that question already. Next one, MS uh, MGS Revival One. Did you put the big dark mode toggle in a hidden menu? <laughs> um, I'm not sure if that's what you were hoping for or not, but yes. It is in. It is uh, now not uh, on your uh, screen by default. Um, that way, it is not taking up more screen space. That's what I'm hoping you're asking for, because um, that's what we did. <laughs> um, all right. Next, um, Prime Gaming, the Barbarian Yorp. 
I don't, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm saying your name right. Anyway, uh, crazy idea, but vision might make more sense than light for new new DMs. That's true. Yeah, I think that that might make more sense, um, especially when you're talking about individual tokens. Um, I also think too, um, there's there. this does bring up a, a, another point that we are looking at. There might be, although right now there's not, but there might be in the future, some ways that we can update the terminology to fit better with how people use it. And we're gonna look at those. Those are not off limits for us. Um, there are some things that we are seeing down the line where um, the the current functionality has has iterated and improved to a point where now it's very different. And we wanna make sure that we we can properly communicate to users what that means. And this is a great example. Maybe we talk more about vision than we talk about light, not sure. Um, e either way, right now, uh, Try not to make a whole lot of changes there. Um, all right, next one from our friend Revolver here. Uh, this looks like more than just a UI reskin. There is new functionality here too. What other new functionality does this unlock in the future? Oh boy. <laughs> yes, there's lots of cool things that we can do here. Um, and actually there's a lot of things underneath this as well. You might actually look at the, the sidebar and think, especially if you're a developer, well, that's it didn't take that long. There's just some CSS changes. Actually, there's lots of things that we have done in the background that are going to accelerate us into the future. Um, we are we have created all new components that we're going to start using and introducing. We have um, we are going to start using a new graphics rendering engine on the back end. We've talked a little bit about that in the past for other things. Um, so there is lots of things underneath this that we are doing to try to put ourselves in a much better position. Now, the heart of your question is, I think. What what's new coming? <laughs> um, a lot of those things are uh, um, a lot of ideas right now. And uh, I, I can't quite tell you all the ideas, uh, mostly because we're not sure if we'll even do it that way. We might do it a completely different way. Um, what I can tell you is what's coming next after this toolbar. And that is we're going to look at measure tools and we're gonna try to introduce uh, new shapes because of that. Um, some of the underlying technology that we've implemented allows us to do this in a much cleaner way and gives us more options. So you'll see some of that in the redesign of that measure tool. Um, after that, we're talking about doing the fog of war, um, fog of war tool um, and redesigning that in a way that you will be able to have a brush that can actually apply just the classic fog of war. Um, that's uh, um, <laughs> sort of a base functionality that a lot of new users really, really appreciate. So. Um, so yeah, I hope that gives you a little bit of an idea, but uh, yeah, yeah, we'll 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 uh, we'll be in touch with all the new things that are coming. All right, next, um, Oxid Fox, why turn order stay white? Don't skin in dark mode. <laughs> um, that's a good point. First, I'm in light mode, and the toolbar is all dark mode. So first thing to answer your question is. This toolbar will actually be just this way. It won't be in light mode or dark mode or anything like that. We're just going to have the toolbar in dark mode. If you have a severe um, problem with that, let us know in the comments. And that's where, or in the feedback, um, that's where we will start looking and like, oh, maybe we do need to consider this uh, as a light mode and dark mode. Um, but we're going to start trying to create dark mode elements um, and see if that works uh, for the majority of these cases. But so that that's the first thing. Uh, to, to mention is I'm currently actually in light mode. So this should be in light mode. Um, the other part is this is the actual old UI um, and we kept it there. This button literally just opens the same, same thing. Um, in the future, we might very well redesign this uh, um, uh, turn order. Um, sorry, I forgot that I wasn't demoing anymore. <laughs> um, the... Uh, we might we might redesign this turn order um, into the new components. For example, into what the the dice roller looks like. We might very well do that. Um, but yeah, that's why right now it is currently white. I know it's sort of jarring, um, but that's that's kind of how it how it came about. Now, yeah. all right, Prime Gaming, the barbaric barbaric yarp. Will there be an option to set mouse wheel to zoom as a default rather than pan? So currently. Um, mouse scrolling does zoom. The clicking the mouse, the middle mouse button actually pans. Um, so 
right now, there's not an option necessarily to change that functionality. Um, that's just sort of baked in there. But we, I want to hear that feedback. So thank you very much for asking that question. I assume that you're looking for something more specific. So um, uh, maybe when the feedback form comes out, maybe you can detail a little bit more about what you're looking for, and we can see how, how that'll work. Um, you asked another question right after it. Um, with plans to update the, v, the VTT functionality approaching, do those plans include integrating custom scripts and macros to the main VTT? There are some that are essential to DMing that should be out of the box. Actually, this is a great point. Um, this is a really great point. As we start to redesign, we are going to take input from all places. Um, that includes people that have created API scripts. Um, and in some cases, we might just take those wholesale. We'll see. Um, the big thing that is uh, the difference is when we start looking at making a redesign, we are we are thinking about our entire audience. And so what we want to make sure we do is give each and every one of those new features, those new redesigns that we go through, a proper look at, is this usable? Is this usable for people that are um, uh, new versus power users? Is this usable for people that have no experience with technology? Is this usable on touch devices? Is this usable on um, uh, big monitors or TVs? There's lots and lots of concerns um, when we start introducing new functionality to our entire player base. And so each time we go through, we are gonna take a look at some of those mod scripts that do some of those things today, say, what's working about these things? Why do people? Why do so many people love this thing and need it? Okay, here's here, let's borrow and beg from that. But also, let's make sure that it fits the entirety of our audience and that, that everybody that could use this thing now can use this thing. And so there will be a pass as we go through of like, oh, maybe we change this, we modify this, these things um, as we go through. In fact, you might even see some of those changes in the, uh, the measure tool as we come through. Um, some of them might feel very similar to you. All right, um, let's see. Our good friend Revolver has come back with another question. Have you discussed implementing hold spacebar to pan as a standard in canvas-based tool like Figma and Photoshop? Actually, I have thought about it heavily. Every single time I go to pan, I smack that spacebar and it doesn't work. I think, man, I really wish that would work. Um, it's a thing that, that we'll talk about. And if we get a lot of feedback about it, that's something that we'll prioritize. At the moment, not necessarily changing a lot of those, those, um, those shortcuts, but if we find that a lot of people are, are having that problem, uh, or at least sort of misclicking because of the spacebar, then that's something that we'll look at. Right now, I think there's two different ways to pan, um, and adding a third one sounds like a lot, uh, but we'll see. All right, next, uh, uh, Prime Gaming again, is opt-in percentage the only KPI, or are there other indicators y'all are tracking around that's interested in what you see as successful? One of the big ones is going to be opt-in percentage, yeah. Uh, but there are definitely other ways that we're looking at this too. In fact, we're starting to look at a lot of the tools and their um, their individual interactions as a part of their own prioritization, right? So we know how many times people use the measure tool, for example, and we know how many times people use the drawing tool, for, for example. Um, and so those will prioritize both the redesign of them and set a baseline for when can we opt in. If is are this many people still using this tool, or are they uh, will they use the new thing or the old thing? So those things will be ways that we we measure. But our primary metric right now is opt in. Um, we're we're really hoping that a lot of people can opt in. They 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 feel like this is an improvement to them, and they stay opted in. So um, yeah. So let us know if. If there's a reason that you can't stay opted in, not just because your own preference, but, um, but because there is something that's specifically holding you back from using the new toolbar, I want you to hit that feedback button when we when we add it to the UI. And I want you to tell us what that thing is before you opt out. F feel free to opt out, but let us know because um, that will really help. Um, all right, next question or last question I have. Um, I might have missed it. Oh, this is from um, Kuvinet. Cuvenet? Cuvenet. I'm not sure. Uh, I might have missed it, but will there be a, a viewable roadmap to follow on these uh, on for these uh, these changes? Um, at the moment, we have a uh, a redesign landing page 
that you will be able to go on to. We can actually link it into the um, into the chat. Somebody might have already done so, hopefully. Um, and where you'll be able to see what's coming next. Um, right now, we don't have the future features as we uh, um, have talked a little bit about, but you'll be able to see the um, the next things that we're looking at for the redesign when we finally commit to them. But as far as like a long roadmap, like what are we going to do for the next year? That's something that we're not really going to publish. And the, the reason for that is not because we want to keep you in the dark. It's been because we don't want to commit to a thing that we're not really ready to commit to yet. Um, and so, so we're not necessarily going to go too far into the future because if I start planning out my sessions, for example, in, in my game, right, as a GM, I plan my session. I say, we're going to do this, 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 and this, and this. I'm going to start railroading my players. Well, if we do the same thing with a roadmap, we start planning out all of these things. We start railroading that dialogue that we want to have with you. And we want to leave that up to flexibility. We want to say, well, maybe we don't want to do this next after that. Maybe we want to do something else because the users have told us that they need that. So that's why we're not going to necessarily show a long-term roadmap, but we understand that you want to see some of the new things coming out and we want you to see those things. So as soon as we know, and we've committed to it, we want to let you know those things too. Um, the other thing that I, I think you're probably looking at is you want to be able to um, give feedback on the things that we're thinking about. The best way to do that is in the ideas and suggestion form, go through there, find the, uh, the ideas that you have, and, and throw your vote in for those ideas and suggestions. Oftentimes, you'll find my name in there, and I've thrown a link to my actual uh, calendar. Feel free to use that link, schedule a meeting with me specifically, and we can talk. I want to have those conversations, but I want to have them in a, we could do these things, not a published roadmap sort of way. So I really appreciate your feedback. So that's that's a great question. Thank you. Um, oh, we got another one. Uh, Prime Gaming uh, Games... So Prime Gaming, we're going to go with that one. Sailnet, Sailnet, Games, Sail. yeah. Um, will there be a pop-up for folks when they log in to a game to alert them of the changes and prompt them to opt in? Yeah, there will. Um, there will, actually. We're uh, currently in the process of, of finalizing that. You've seen it a couple of times as I've gone through, it doesn't look like where, how we're going to have it. <laughs> um, but yes, we want to, we want to do two things. One, we want to inform people of what has changed the big project. And we want to inform people, number two, inform people of individual changes as they come out. Um, what we don't want to do, which is the third one, and maybe you're getting into this, I'm not sure, but I'll say it anyway. We don't want to annoy people. <laughs> so as we go through, we're going to try to really find uh, thread that fine line of letting people know about the cool things that are coming out so they can try it out, but not annoying them so that they are they just completely disregard it. So you'll you'll see how some of that when that comes out, you'll see how that looks. And um, if you have thoughts about it, please give me feedback around that. So yeah, you know, we we can well, those things are up for change too. Yeah. Um, all right. Uh, last question. I, I think that we're probably coming to a close here. Um, and uh, this is a good one. Thank you for the uh, barbaric yarp for this question. Are you all hiring? Um, love the direction you're moving in. Looks super promising for Roll20's future. I really, really appreciate that vote of confidence. Um, I am very, very excited about where we're going, and I am super excited to be a part of it. I feel thankful that uh, that the team kind of trusts me to help with this, um, and uh, I am I'm very excited. I've used Roll Twenty for years, even before I started working here, and uh, I am um, I am passionate and have played lots and lots of role playing games. So I'm excited about the future of role playing games and what we can do with uh, with this technology. Are we hiring? Always, yes. Um, but what positions? I'm sure you're asking, and how can you get into it? Um, keep an eye out on our LinkedIn pages and our Twitter. We we let people know of new positions that we are hiring for. Um, we are we are a large team and we're continuing to grow. So um, keep an eye out for those areas. And um, when something that fits your skill set comes up, let us know and uh, and we'll we'll talk. Well, thank you all very much for um, sitting through this long demo. Uh, as you can tell, I'm very very excited about all of it. So. Um, again, if you have more questions or anything, uh, follow up on that feedback form. Also, um, there are public uh, demos that we're going to do similar to this one. In fact, I, if, if you sign up for it, it'll be nearly the same script. Um, 
We're going to be doing all this week. I've got um, two slots every day for the rest of this week, um, some of which are still have positions open. So if you want to get into a more, uh, it, it'll be 10 people maximum, and you'll be able to ask questions directly to me on camera and things like that, um, then sign up for one of those slots and uh, we'll talk more. Um, if you have more specific feedback or want me to get into a little bit more of, uh, of, of what might be coming, feel free to, to sign up. I really appreciate your time today. Thank you very much. And uh, I'll talk to you later.